Now that we've spent a few lessons talking about Java virtual threads and platform threads, I have a confession to make. We are not going to be using Java virtual threads or platform threads directly in this class at all. We're not going to program them directly. Now, you will see how we're going to use them in a rather cool way when it comes to configuring Spring to use virtual threads. But in some sense, that's kind of hidden behind the scenes. You don't have to think about it very much. What we are going to do, however, is use Java structured concurrency. And as we'll see here, Java structured concurrency is a way of enabling many tasks to run concurrently or in parallel. I think it's probably a better word because it's usually parallel. It's, in fact, it's embarrassingly parallel atop the virtual threading mechanisms that are available in Java 19 and beyond. So the virtual threading mechanisms are really there as a kind of as plumbing. And then we're going to talk about how you can program them or you will program them using Java structured concurrency. So that's what we're actually going to focus on. So the virtual thread stuff was just kind of a trampoline to bounce us into a discussion of what we're really going to be doing. So let's talk a bit about what structured concurrency is. So structured concurrency is a framework that was added to Java fairly recently in the last couple of years. You can see here, this is the, the specification for Java structured concurrency. And it was created in 2021. It was updated in summer of 2022. And it now is available in Java 19 and beyond. And basically, the goal of structured concurrency is to try to make it easier to develop concurrent programs that are easier to write, easier to understand, hopefully quickly, quicker to write, because you won't have to think about so many things. It's very stylized and ideally safer. So what does safer mean in this context? What safer means in this context is if you use structured concurrency, you won't end up with thread leaks and orphaned threads. What is an orphan thread? Well, in traditional unstructured concurrency, you can have a thread and then you go ahead and create another thread. And the first thread, T1, creates thread T2, and then it goes on its merry way. And thread T2 becomes an orphan, even though its parent created it. The parent could, could shut down. The parent could go off and do other stuff. So you might leak that thread. And so it makes things difficult to reason about, difficult to um, debug. In contrast with structured concurrency, as we will shortly see, the threads that are created have to live and die within the enclosing scope. So they can't leak or escape and become orphaned. And we'll talk a lot more about that. Java's structured concurrency paradigm, the model that we're using, is intentionally designed to mimic concepts of structured programming. Most of you are way too young to remember structured programming, most likely. But back in the day, in the 60s and 70s, and kind of the beginning of the 80s, there was this alternative paradigm called structured programming. And really what it was, it was a, a reaction to unstructured programming which meant you could have go-tos and code that was all smeared around your address space, which made it next to impossible to understand. So the idea was essentially to have well-defined entry and exit points for the flow of execution through blocks of code. So you could have an if statement that was well-structured. You could have a loop statement like a while loop or a for loop that was well-structured. You could have a function that would have an entry point and an exit point that was well-defined. And so the idea behind structured concurrency is much the same. You want to have a nesting of lifetimes of operations that mirrors their syntactic nesting in the code. So the semantics and the, the syntax harmonize with each other. Now, structured concurrency is generally intended primarily for what are known as embarrassingly parallel programs, which is a funny name. Embarrassingly parallel just means that there's little, usually no dependency or need to communicate between tasks or to share results between them until they're all finished. My favorite example, if you've taken my classes before, you know this is my favorite example of embarrassingly parallel, is a laundromat where you could have dozens of washers and dryers that are doing your clothes. They all run in parallel. As long as there's free washers or dryers, you can keep scaling up to whatever amount of clothes you have to wash, which is helpful if you procrastinate washing your clothes over a period of time. And so that's a great example of embarrassingly parallel. One washer doesn't care what the other washer's load is. They, they all wash independently. The word embarrassingly here comes from the phrase embarrassment of riches, which you may have heard. And it, it's just kind of a whimsical phrase. It just means there's so much parallelism, we don't know what to do about it. It's, it's embarrassing how much parallelism we have. The way in which 
embarrassingly parallel programs are used most commonly today is in modern microservice-based cloud computing environments, like Spring, for example. But there's other ones as well. And you might have something called an API gateway where clients send requests to the API gateway, and then the API gateway takes the incoming requests and sort of spreads them around or scatters them out to a bunch of microservices running concurrently in the backend cluster, and then gathers all the results together, creates a composite result, and sends it back to the user. So that's a good example of using embarrassingly parallel programming models in modern microservice-based approaches. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing in this class. So let's take a quick look at an example of Java structured concurrency that makes the start and end of concurrent code explicit. That's what this example is really showing. And you can find this example in the EX3 project in my Loom folder in my live lessons GitHub repository. So this particular example, we'll go through very quickly now. We'll, we'll walk through it in more detail later when we get into the nitty gritty of the APIs. So at a high level, what's happening here is we're using a scope and we're using something called a try with resources block in Java. And the try with resources block says, initialize this particular variable in this open, closed, paren portion of the try with resources block and create this object. And this object will then be destroyed when the scope exits, when the closed curly brace is reached in the execution flow through the program. And what we're creating here is an implicitly typed variable of type structured task scope shutdown on failure. And we're making a new instance of structured task scope shutdown on failure. And that's a particular kind of concurrent mechanism that's structured. And what happens here is if anything goes awry, that the first thing that fails causes the whole scope to shut down. We'll come back to that in more detail later. We then go ahead and allocate an array of, uh, array of futures to big fractions. And we store that in a variable called results. I won't spend much time on that right now. And then we're going to iterate through a large number of random big fractions up to count in size, in magnitude. And for each of the big fractions in that generated range, we're going to go ahead and fork a new virtual thread to reduce and multiply that big fraction by some constant. Again, don't get too caught up in the details of what the example is doing. We're just doing some long running computation and we're forking it, which says create a new virtual thread. So for each of those big fractions, we're going to make a new virtual thread. As you saw in the previous video, we can make lots and lots of virtual threads. And that virtual thread is then uh, added to the, or the, the results, which is this array of futures. The, the return value of, of fork is a future to type T, which in this case is big fraction. So we end up with an array of futures to big fractions. And all those futures are basically proxies for computations that are running in those virtual threads in the background somewhere. And so we start everything up. They're all off to the races. And then the next thing we do is we call join on scope, which basically says, it's what's called a barrier synchronizer. It says, wait here until all of those computations have finished. And it doesn't block, but it waits. The, the flow of control does not proceed past join until all these calls are done or until an exception is thrown. Let's assume for sake of argument, it all goes well. So at that point, we then have our results, and then we can do something with the results. We can sort and print them. And we'll talk about how to do that in a later video. So the key point of all this is that we don't leave this scope until all the computations are done, thereby abiding by this concept of enclosing the subtasks within a syntactic scope where we don't continue until everything's done in that scope. So what are the benefits of this approach? Well, one thing it does is it allows you to be able to split the flow of control into multiple threads or tasks and make sure that they always complete at the end of the flow. So the flow of control splits at the beginning, just like we saw in that example. Computations take place concurrently or in parallel. And then at the end, we wrap everything up before we continue on outside that scope, before we leave the scope. So the subtasks can basically do their thing. They typically don't interact because they're embarrassingly parallel. And the framework, the structured concurrency framework, monitors the task to make sure that they're working or they fail. And they all have to finish before we can exit the scope. So the, the take home point here is the lifetime of a subtask, like T2, is confined to the syntactic block of its parent task, say T1. And therefore, you can't end up with orphaned threads. 
everything is going to be done by the time you try to exit that scope. So that's the end of the overview of structured concurrency in Java.